This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. So in this uh, podcast, what I want to do is to uh, talk uh, through the whole kind of question of what happened uh, in the 1970s. Now, strictly speaking, I really want to talk about what happened in the late 1960s into the 1970s, because I think there is a period of disruption uh, which is going on around the world, actually, during this period. And the disruption was to some degree political and social, uh, and then it became economic. And I think that it's worthwhile asking sorts of questions as to how that succession occurred. Um, but I think also I want to continue with the argument that I made that the solutions to the crisis of the 1940s, 1950s, uh, were in fact at the root of uh, the crisis that unfolded uh, in the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s. Now, during the 1960s, there was uh, a great deal of uh, uh, agitation. And I'm going to use the United States by and large on this, but you will see echoes of this elsewhere. Agitation uh, around uh, the developmental model that seemed to come out of 1945. I, I've argued that uh, one of the big uh, answers to the problems of the 1930s uh, during the 1940s was militarization uh, and then also suburbanization and the reorganization of uh, urban life, the interstate highway system in this country, uh, the advent of the automobile and, 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 the, and the like. So that was the 1960s. But as you go in through the 1960s, some of the things that had uh, come out of the uh, period of the 1940s, 1950s, started to be center of agitation. Uh, now, I mentioned uh, the very strong influence of McCarthyism, uh, which was direct in the sense that uh, many people on the left were purged, but indirect in the sense that uh, our thinking moved away from anything being very, very overtly political. That we started to look for neutral positions to talk about how we understood the world and what we would do in the world. And those neutral positions were largely set by the advent of a humor, much, what you might call sort of a scientific approach to social questions. <clears throat> so that uh, economics became much more mathematized. Uh, we started to do data set analysis and correlations and all the rest of it. A lot of the time we were actually just uh, showing through data and through information what we already, already knew to be the case. Uh, for instance, uh, the whole questions of racial discrimination in housing markets. Well, uh, you know, it took a research project uh, to document uh, how, exactly what that, that was amounted to uh, in order for people to say, accept that something had to be done about it. So, People, in, even on the left, were burying, if you like, their left agenda in technical, uh, mathematical, sociological reasoning. And a lot of that reasoning led to what might be called a real, a real top-down approach to what was going on around. And the sense came that somehow or other we were not uh, living in a world that we were constructing, we were having the world constructed around us by the developers, by the engineers, by the, the, the social scientists and, and the planners, and that this was, this, this was not uh, really uh, very acceptable to us. So we started to find very important signs of revolt against all of that during the 1960s. For example, the free speech movement uh, in Berkeley. Uh, with a movement against the kind of education which uh, highlighted uh, sort of technocratic uh, scientific uh, modes of analysis. Uh, and uh, that was, um, you know, a very significant uh, event. And people started to say, well, you know, we're not studying the right kinds of things in the right kinds of ways. And so we started to find in the late 1960s, a lot of that emphasis starts to come up with students for democratic society saying, we know we've got to change the curriculum, we've got to change our educational structures. So there was all of that was, was, was going on. 
And it wasn't only in this country, for instance, uh, in France uh, during the 19, late 1960s and uh, the famous movement of 68 was a movement uh, based amongst the students, based uh, about uh, on, on, on the way in which the state and, and politics was being wrapped up in this sort of technocratic uh, discussion. Uh, in the United States, when um, Kennedy became president, he imported the so-called best and the brightest from Harvard uh, to try to run the government. And, you know, and that gave us McNamara in the, in the um, Defense Department, and it gave us uh, all, all, all of that. So there was a, a sense that, that things were not going, going right, that the style of life that was evolving under this technocrat technocratic scientific regime was not adequate. The developers were having a good time. There was relatively full employment, but nevertheless, uh, somehow or other, there was something missing. In, in the whole thing and the qualities of life, the qualities of living were, were uh, to some degree inadequate. Now I was thinking of ways in which to portray how, how this, uh, this dichotomy worked out. And I think one of the most easiest ways to do is to say, well, uh, you know, in my field, which was uh, urbanization and urban planning and all the rest of it, there was this real serious conflict that erupted in the late 1960s between Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs. Now, Robert Moses was a big urban planner, being very, very uh, influential in the 1930s in building highways and all the rest of it. And after 1945, played a very important role in the re-engineering of the whole New York metropolitan region. In so doing, he was building highways, he was building motorways, he was building large public works, um, and, and, and the like. It was, a, it was a lot of mega projects with Robert Moses in charge and the charge against him was that he wasn't paying any attention to the qualities of the urban environment or the social, uh, the social meaning of what he was doing. Uh, the famous phrase was that he took a meat axe to the Bronx, for example, that he rammed these big highways through. I arrived in this country in 1969, and in Baltimore at the time, uh, there was a huge movement against uh, the new highways which, was, uh, which were planned. The new highways went through parts of the city which uh, weren't good quality or could be seen as good quality, and that, that quality was being destroyed by highways being, being set. And there was a movement against destruction called MAD which is agitating against these, these, these movements. And Jane Jacobs came along and started to write these things about you know, city life and urban life and, and, and talked about the way in which neighborhood life and the qualities of neighborhood life were very, very important. Uh, security within, a, within a, an area could be uh, assured by uh, eyes on the street and by local people seeing what is going on and how it's going on, people knowing each other, trusting each other. So that local trust, which was classic in sort of ethnic neighborhoods and, uh, and the like. And her argument was that Moses was destroying urbanization and urban, the qualities of urban life in favor of this mega project of highways everywhere and suburbs everywhere. And the suburbs increasingly were beginning to be thought of as, as rather empty and soulless, even though they were economically efficient and economically uh, well, quite well set up. So this distinction between, between uh, if you like, the Robert Moses view of the world and the Jane Jacobs view of the world started to become very much implanted in urban politics and in and political life. People were agitating against these mega projects, against these highway systems being built through the city. And that protest was to some degree successful. And I mentioned in a former pro, uh, podcast uh, the, the experience of uh, Paris during the sort of Haussmann era, where Haussmann rebuilt the city and everybody was kind of excited about it initially. But then by the time you get to 1868, uh, the qualities of life in the city get a, and the financing go to astray and Haussmann fell from grace. Well, at a certain point, Robert Moses fell from grace. And, uh, and, and so the whole kind of Moses approach, but the Moses approach had dominated for two you know, for two decades, in effect, and that really radically reorganized uh, how how society was set up, 
uh, and how urbanization was set up. Jane Jacobs was then kind of saying, well, we have to reconstruct urban life around this idea of neighborhood, neighborhood friendliness, neighborhood solidarities, maybe ethnic solidarities and all the rest of it. So she was really pushing for that very, very much. And uh, it was true that, for instance, in the Baltimore case, uh, the schedule of motorway building was right through this area close to the waterfront, which was actually a very beautiful area and now is a highly gentrified, very valued part of the city, but was threatened uh, during the 1960s by, by the, they were going to build a motorway through there. And then you wouldn't see, have access to the water. You wouldn't see any of the kind of life that goes on in these uh, sort of uh, neighborhoods which are butting on the water it would be destroyed by the fact that all the way it would be was a, a massive motorway. So there was uh, these areas of discontent of that sort. Uh, uh, first wave feminism, for example, uh, one of the things that was said was that it was really uh, at war with that place which has no name and what they meant was the suburbs. The suburban lifestyle was actually structured around a certain idea of gender relations, the woman at home, you know, doing all the neighborhood stuff and the man working in, uh, you know, commuting somewhere uh, for the job, there's that kind of that kind of thing. And first wave feminists found this uh, highly, highly oppressive. Uh, and, and in many ways, people started also to recognize that they had no choice. I mean, we had a theory about capital, it's about choice. But if you wanted to live in a decent house and a decent living environment in the, the mid 1960s, it was only one place to go, and that was to go to the suburbs, because the central cities were deteriorating. The central cities were the locus of, uh, of course, marginalized populations and increasing impoverishment. And, and uh, there too, uh, we find a, a, a critical kind of uh, question as to the qualities of life in, in, in urban areas. And during the 1960s, this parlayed into, of course, the civil rights movement. And the civil rights movement was about many things, access to jobs, access to recognition, access to political power, uh, uh, but access to housing was also, also critical. And access to housing was, you know, which is where the race question became absolutely foundational. And, and so the, the question of, 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 of uh, the quality of life in urban areas and, and, and in particularly in racially uh, segregated areas was, was very much being approached by the technocratic wing of planning by kind of saying, well, we have to, you know, what was called gild the ghetto, that is put money into the center of the cities, uh, or we have to disperse the ghetto, which is to try to find ways to, to get po the impoverished black populations out of the ghettos and put them into kind of suburban uh, areas and some of that uh, uh, went on, but again, this was a very sort of technocratic uh, kind of exercise. But after the assassination of Martin Luther King uh, in uh, April of 1968, uh, you have these simultaneous uprisings in pretty much all the cities around the United States, and you were getting urban uprisings also in the sort of immigrant communities in some European cities along the same time. Uh, there was, there, there was, there, there were serious, serious unrest. And so the, the, the race question was, was, was highly significant. The, the, uh, the, the eruptions, if you want to call them that, or the disruptions that were occurring in the wake of the assassination of Martin Luther King uh, created a, 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 a sort of a political situation, uh, which was again held to be untenable. Now, this is all going on, of course, the United States is fighting a war and it's fighting the Vietnam War. And it's telling us uh, all kinds of things about that war and how that war is being waged and to what effect and, and so on. So those, so the war, the anti-war movement is also very strong. So you have the, the, uh, the, the civil rights movement, you have the anti-war movement, you have the student movement, and they're all to some degree overlapping to some degree. Uh, but uh, and then and then the women's movement beginning to emerge. There was a kind of environmental questions coming up, particularly suburbanization, doing dastardly things to uh, air and qualities of air and water and land and so on. So there were there, there were all of these areas of discontent, and and those areas of discontent could find really no form of expression. 
because government was sort of in this technocratic mode. It didn't want to be ex uh, explicitly political. That was the way in the wake of McCarthyism. So it wanted to treat everything as a technocratic kind of issue. And many people were kind of saying, it's not a technocratic issue, it's a social and political issue, and we have to address the social and political issue. And this is what Jane Jacobs was saying. This is, and this is what uh, uh, the civil rights movement and particularly the neighborhood movement and, uh, and, and, uh, and that was saying. The one area where it was a very, very peculiar was uh, the labor movement. Now, the labor movement, as I suggested, was, was divided into what might be called affluent workers on the one hand, and, and, and the, the, the sort of marginalized workers on the other. And the affluent workers were in, in unions, and the unions were not, not uh, collectively very radical. I mean, there were particular unions that were more radical than others, uh, but the unions had fallen into this pattern during the 1950s and 1960s of bargaining for the rights of their members. And they looked after their members. They didn't actually uh, involve themselves in, quote, class politics, because this whole kind of question of class politics has been something that had been eviscerated in the McCarthyism of the post-war period. And when it came to sort of international affairs, the AFL-CIO uh, uh, sort of foreign branch uh, was deeply, deeply involved in anti-communist uh, anti politics was deeply involved in, in the kind of uh, backing up uh, the State Department uh, and the CIA and all of its anti uh, sort of radical uh, coups and, and, and the like. So the labor movement was not, was not fully behind much of what was, uh, what, was, what was going on. It was sort of doing its own thing. And some aspects of it were uh, very, very influential. Uh, particularly when it came to national legislation. So you'll find things like occupational safety and health, uh, environmental protection, those kinds of things start to come uh, very much on the, on the board. And Labour, by and large, is in favour of that, though the environmental issue, it was often, you often find uh, Labour was organised against it. Because big Labour, particularly in the construction sector, was very much taken up with the Moses Project. The Moses Project created large-scale uh, job job opportunities and and uh, the construction unions in particular uh, the hard hat movement uh, turned out in new york city to sort of attack the the student movement so there was there were some disruptions of that kind but by the time you get to a, a late 1960s this is then confirmed in the late 1960s by what i might call uh, uh, all of this coming together around a widespread legitimation crisis a legitimation crisis because people did not trust the government and the big uh, item in that was of course the the pentagon papers uh, which showed that the us had got into the vietnam war through a lie and had maintained its stance in the vietnam war by a systematic lying and trust in big government now government lies and i think this is an important point to reflect upon in when, when it comes to lies i mean donald trump is notorious as a liar and everybody knows he's a liar and he lies all the time but there are consequential lies and inconsequential lies a lot of donald trump's lies are inconsequential but the things like the gulf of tonkin resolution that got us into the vietnam war and what the Pentagon Papers then showed that was the internal assessment of how the world war was going. Um, that showed that th this was a big lie. And there are big lies. So, for instance, another big lie is the big lie about Saddam Hussein having weapons of mass destruction, which then had, you know, led to the invasion of Iraq. And that's had earth-shattering consequences for human history. So this was a consequential lie that was told by the Bush administration and people like Colin Powell and so on. And I, I, it really bothers me when somebody like Colin Powell comes along and says he can't stand all this lying going on by Donald Trump. And I'm kind of, you know, uh, you, did, you did a consequential lie and, and, and you should be held accountable for that consequential lie. So there are consequential lies. Now, 
just as a matter of thing, I, I asked the sort of question, how many lies that Donald Trump has set out are consequential? Well, I think there are, <clears throat> there are some consequential ones. Uh, and I think that, for instance, he's lying about uh, climate change is one of them. Uh, I think uh, this whole kind of question about lying about the election is, is, is another consequential lie. It really does threaten democracy in this country in very, very important ways. So yes, he has some consequential lies, but I think it's important for us to, to recognize that he's not alone in consequential lies, that pretty much uh, every president of the United States has engaged in a, a pattern of some consequential lies in order to get done what they're doing. For instance, Roosevelt uh, got the United States into World War II in large part through some consequential lies. Now, whether that was a good thing or a bad thing is another, is another issue, but the point is, that the end of the 19th end of the 1960s, everybody started to realize that government could not be trusted, that politics could not be trusted, that therefore things had to be done through the streets, through direct action, that 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 the only thing that the the government would listen to was going to be you know over the war, for example, was going to be mass street action, and of course we saw some mass street action building in the end of the 1960s going into the 1970s. So there was this legitimation crisis. And you'll find it going on pretty much everywhere. I mean, the movement of 68 uh, in Paris was uh, paralleled by the sort of Chicago events in the United States. But 68 in Paris was also paralleled by uh, the killing of uh, students in Mexico City just prior to the Olympic Games. There was a student movement in, in Thailand, in Bangkok, there were student movements in in many cities, there were massive student movements, even in Britain. So, and, and, and the really the, the questioning was the legitimacy of the, uh, of the of, if you like, the mental conceptions of the world, the dominant mental conceptions of the world, the legitimacy of them in the face of the fact that, that uh, they was not really meeting people, what people felt were their real needs and their real concerns. So this legitimacy crisis then put politics into, in, in, into a, a bit of a corner. The state was no longer uh, trusted. There's a lot of street action, a lot of things going on, a lot of political action on these, on these different fronts, civil rights movement, anti-war movement, student movement, uh, feminist movement, nascent uh, environmental movement. All, all of those movements were, 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 were there questioning very, very seriously uh, the, 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 where everything was, was going and, 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 and what it was about. Now, that was, if you like, the, the, the ideological configuration that existed. Now, I'm, I, it's interesting, I kind of think about that, and, you know, I came into the United States right at right 1969, right at the point where the, the, this whole thing peaked. And oh, one of the things that then happened, of course, was we learned after a bit that this was not a game, this was for serious. And when they started killing students at Kent State, uh, Jackson State, uh, people realized, well, oh, hey, this is, you know, this is not, this is not something that the street action is not just simply a game that we're playing with, with there's, there's going to be real kind of repressive you know, consequences. The other thing which was critical, of course, was the draft. And the suspension of the draft, and I can't remember this moment exactly when it was suspended, but the draft was a big, pan, big kind of problem, and people were agitating against the draft uh, a great deal, going to fight this meaningless, what many people increasingly regarded as this meaningless war in Vietnam. So that also was a part of the, of, of the, the question. So there is this legitimation crisis and political crisis uh, and, and, and trust crisis and quality of life crisis. Uh, like the technocrats wanted to build highways, but they didn't want you know, good places to sit down. And, you know, people, students would go over for trips to Europe and they would go to sort of French cities and Italian cities, and there would be, I don't know, sidewalk cafes, and the quality of urban life would seem to be kind of, you know, and they would return to the United States and say, well, this is a miserable, miserable place. You know, where do we go? So 
and, and, and of course, in 1968 or 69, there were no sidewalk cafes in New York City. Um, since then, people have put sidewalk cafes, though I must say, the sidewalk cafe on Second Avenue with gasoline fumes <laughs> all around you is very different from sitting in a nice sort of uh, square of Saint Germain or somewhere like that with a cafe in France, you know. But nevertheless, you, you can see the point about this sort of whole question of lifestyle and, 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 and all the rest of it, uh, and, and political recognition and, and political. Uh, a power that they were all very much on the agenda. Now the thing about this was that this then got turned into an economic crisis. Initially there were signs of this economic crisis and the signs were simply this that yes uh, the expansion after World War II was largely debt financed but it was debt financed and you can Get, recuperate the debt if that increases productivity and increases well-being and all the rest of it. You can recuperate it. But with the Vietnam War, we got into a situation where the choice was really guns or butter. That's a famous formulation. And what really happened was that, that under Johnson in particular, the choice was made that they were going to have guns and butter. And that meant tremendous kind of uh, fiscal strain upon upon budgets and fiscal strain which was exacerbated by by the military uh, confrontations going on around the world which were leading into uh, sort of uh, escalating military budgets for vietnam in particular but not only vietnam it was also the technology and the new uh, the, the, the new equipment that the the, the the armed forces were going to need so this was so, so, so this was an, an economic stress. This was followed by one of the things that happened after 1968, in particular with the eruptions and, and, and the, in a sense, revolutionary uprisings in many US cities. Uh, the federal government could think of only one thing to do, which is to throw money at it, to pour money into uh, uh, the urban crisis. So there were all these commissions in 1968, uh, the Kerner Commission and the Douglas Commission, all on about the kind of question of how did it get to the point where a large segment of US population was erupting in violent, uh, uh, violent way. Um, could something be done about it? If so, what should be done about it? And the answer was, well, we're going to have to fund uh, our way and out of the urban crisis. So you, you, again, where is that money coming from? Uh, the uh, taxation rates at that time was, were all, all fairly high. They were around seventy odd percent, something of that kind, on the highest uh, on the highest earners. And, but 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 the U.S. was not in a position uh, very much to to to, to be able to tolerate this this economic situation and one of the results of this was of course inflation now we're coming around right now there's a lot of discussion about inflation so it's worthwhile thinking a little bit about where inflation came from in the 1960s 1970s and my argument would be this yes there are many sources of inflation but one of the key sources of inflation is going to be uh rising wages and the affluent workers were increasing their wages during the 1950s and 1960s, 1970s. And so you get rising wages in the monopoly sectors, in the automobile industry, steel industry, and all the rest of it. Now, there were monopoly sectors. And given that there were monopoly sectors, they could simply respond to an increase in wages by raising the cost of their product. So, you know, car prices were going up, wage bargains were struck, there were, you know, there were always hard bargains, and I'm not arguing that the, the corporations were soft about it, but they, they realized that if they, they did uh, concede something on wages, what they, would, what they would concede, they could recoup by raising their prices because there's nobody to compete on with lower. So there was pattern bargaining going on in Detroit between the three big auto companies. They would all roughly cut the same sort of deal with big, big labor. So labor was was doing that, that segment of labor was doing you know okay not 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 fantastically well and you know there were all sorts of problems within the labor movement and within but they were 
fairly powerful in relationship to their the relationship to the corporations. They were also pretty powerful in the Democratic Party. And so between that, the social wage was also going up, and so social welfare was being built up. Social welfare, which was supposed to address uh, the needs of the population. Now again, what we find here is that this was all a sort of top-down thing. Okay, uh, we've got this problem of the Industrial Reserve Army, the unemployed, and so on, and how are they going to live, and so on, so we want to have social security, and then there are people who can't uh, make it, so we have to have welfare. And so we set up welfare, we set up uh, um, things like uh, uh, Medicare and Medicaid and so on. So we set up all of those things. But one, what was found out about those things was, yeah, the technical stuff was fine. But what in effect was happening was there was a lot of discrimination going on here. That The welfare state was discriminatory against women was discriminatory by race and was discriminatory by ethnicity and so on. So that the welfare state uh, in itself became a prime example of a bureaucracy which was needing, meeting the needs of capital but was not meeting the needs of people. So that we have that kind of problem and, and towards the end of the 1960s, early 1970s, uh, a lot of people on the left were anti the welfare state and were criticized, writing sort of critiques of the welfare state and how, how it was about, uh, you know, the advantaging capital versus labor as opposed to meeting the needs of the, of the, of the population. Now, many people right now would like to see some of that welfare state come back, but at that time it was seen as repressive. Uh, and, and again, part and parcel of that atmospherics of technocratic scientific administration, uh, which was dominating uh, the world in the 1960s. So this, the, this, this was part of the, the, the economic scene, that by the time you get to 1970, there's a real serious problem, uh, that the economy is not generating enough, you know, uh, in terms of economics to cover all of these costs, the Vietnam War, the, the, the the, the war on poverty, which uh, uh, Johnson had set up, uh, the, uh, the war on the urban crisis, which was going on towards the end of the 1960s, and, 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 and the war in Vietnam and the wars all around the, all around the globe. So the United States was in a parlous state, and that parlous state was recognized by the international standing of the dollar. The dollar had been very strong, but now it was extremely weak. And, and the United States found itself uh, forced uh, to abandon uh, the Bretton Woods Agreement in which the dollar became the international reserve's currency by being pegged to gold at $35 an ounce. And in 1971, that was all, all abandoned. Now, that was a very significant point. That was where the economy starts to come in. Now, the, the legitimation crisis was really 68 to, to, into the 70s, but the economic crisis really began in the, around 1971, 72. There had been hints of it before, and the hints of it were a rising rate of inflation because wages, as I said, were going up. Uh, the wage level was rising. The, in this period, by the way, uh, shows that uh, there was greater equality in, in, in the United States during this period than there, there was, uh, has been ever since. And that uh, the period since has seen the growth of inequality, whereas the 1960s saw a growth of equality, but the growth of equality was such as to be uh, registered through the rising wage rate, and the rising wage rate uh, produces the rising prices, which produces inflation. So there was there were inflationary pressures towards the end of the 1960s. And there were debt pressures too. The debt started, I said the US debt was a real problem, but there are many sort of urban areas, uh, urban uh, corporations and, and, and public facilities that found themselves in fiscal distress from the late 1960s onwards. In the United States, for example, in New York, there was something called the Urban Development Corporation and that eventually, which was supposedly designed to develop low-income housing for the mass of the population, well, that went bankrupt in 68 or 69, somewhere around there. This is, this, is, this is the sort of thing. So 
the, the economy starts to be a real, a real, a real problem. And but then you get into the 1970s, and big capital is kind of looking at the situation. Now here I think it's very important to ask about you know, what was the capitalist class doing throughout all of this. The capitalist car class in 1945 was largely the big corporations and the big corporate heads and a few of the bankers. By and large the banks were very powerful because they had such a bad reputation coming out of the 1930s. But they had been chafing at the bit all right, right throughout the 1960s. The investment banks in particular wanted to do something or other. Uh, and, and, and be cut free. And they could not be cut free under the Bretton Woods uh, Agreement, which has a lot of capital, capital controls. But the capital controls were abolished in 1971. The investment banks say, yippee, we're off now and doing something. So this is, this is, this is where the, the financial stuff starts to become very critical. But the, the investment banks are already working into a situation in which the, the sudden kind of uh, uh, a, a, a political situation is such that Congress was starting to pass all this anti-corporate legislation, largely at the behest of the unions, but also at the behest of the social movements. So you start to find things like occupational safety and health, consumer protection, environmental protection agency, all those sorts of things were set up uh, during this during this period. And, the, and, and, and by the time you get to 1970, you find a lot of large corporations and the wealthy class are saying enough is enough. And besides, uh, our wealth is being eroded by inflation. We need to keep infl get inflation under control. We need to do something uh, significant uh, in relation to the economy. And then, then what? So then what happened is that after 1971-72, there uh, the only way I could depict this is is, is is in a dramatic way. It's not really true, but it sort of is true. I was to say that after 1971 or two, capital went on strike. It refused to invest. It refused to invest in the face of inflation. It refused to invest in the face of the wage rate determination that's going on and rising wages. It refused to invest in a, in a situation in which indebtedness was really overwhelming uh, as it were, real product output. So, so you, you know, when, when Labour goes on strike, we all, or we all know about it, we don't really think about capital strike. But in fact, at this time, a lot of capital said, we're not going to invest. We're just not going to expand. We're not going to go anywhere. And that began to, to, to create uh, 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 the, the lineaments of a certain depression. And one of the areas which is kind of always fascinating to me, and it's always missed, is you always watch out because one of the precursors to the big crash of 1929 was a crash in the property market in 1927, a couple of years before. What you saw in the United States in 1971-72 was a crash in the property market. And it wasn't only in the United States. It was a crash in the property market in Britain. It was a crash in the property market in Australia. It was a crash in the property market pretty much everywhere. In other words, people have been investing in property development. And property development is sort of an interesting thing. It only gets its returns over a long period. But the returns on that long period are... are are important to have, and there have been a lot of long-term investment in urbanization, highway systems and all the rest of it, urbanization and so on, uh, in the 1960s, and a lot of that was found to be a, a problem in terms of its, uh, of its indebtedness. The United, uh, New York, for example, went through a fiscal crisis, a huge fiscal crisis in 1975, and that huge fiscal crisis had been building during the uh, 1970s because it had, uh, you know, what it was spending on in terms of, you know, public projects and public, uh, and New York City was very important in terms of the global broad project. It had, I don't know, it was in the, one of the top 10 budgets in the world in 1970s. Its budget was so huge relative to everything else. And when the prospect of, of New York going bankrupt came around, uh, all the world leaders started to sort of, call, you know, telephone the Treasury Secretary and say, for God's sake, don't let New York go bankrupt. Because if they do, 
uh, then it's going to be, you know, the whole world is going to be in a mess. And besides, we've got problems like New York too. And so, you know, so the economy started to go sour and it started to go sour in a in, in very, very, very significant ways in that period between 1971, 1975, 1976. In 1975, New York City, in effect, declared bankruptcy. It, it, it didn't really, it, 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 it was sort of bailed out by, by the state. And there was this famous moment where New York appealed uh, to Washington, uh, to President Ford, and said, look, uh, uh, you need to help us out. And Ford said he wasn't going to do it. And the New York Post had this fantastic sort of cover which said, Ford to city drop dead. But that drop dead had actually occurred uh, earlier, it turned out, because uh, New York uh, City, uh, which was on the verge of uh, bankruptcy, uh, <clears throat> needed uh, uh, help from the federal government. But Nixon had said in 1973 in his State of the Union address, I mean, it was a wonderful moment. I, I recall it very much. I was listening to his uh, State of the Union address. And he announced in the State of Union address in 1973, the urban crisis was over. And I remember looking out the window in Baltimore and looking and saying, my God, I, you know, I imagine everybody's dancing in the streets or something like that. But Baltimore was looking as miserable as it had been looking all along uh, ever since I got there. So, so this business of the urban crisis was over. What, what Nixon meant by that was that, that the federal government didn't have the money to be able to throw money at the urban crisis anymore, as it had been doing since 68. So all of that money which had been pouring into urban areas and fed federal assistance to deal with the, the aftermath of the uprisings of, uh, of 1968, all, all, all of that, all of that largesse was suddenly cut off and Nixon just cut it dead in 1973. So you can see these, these, these two moments. First, this moment of 1971 when Nixon goes off the gold standard, 1973 when the urban crisis is uh, declared uh, over, which meant that no money was flowing into the cities. And so New York then goes bankrupt in 1975, and, and or technically goes bankrupt, except that it's bailed out by the state, this kind of a municipal, municipal assistance corporation, Big Mac as it was called, uh, which took over the budget of the city. And the way they took over the budget of the city was absolutely critical. And there are people who remember this very well. The big question was, all right, if New York City is going bankrupt, who is going to bear the cost of that bankruptcy? Is it going to be, uh, are, the, are the bondholders going to have something? Uh, going to lose something? Are they going to get a haircut? Or are you going to have to reorganize the city so it p totally pays off the debt to the bondholders? <clears throat> now, there's something interesting here, too. But, and, and this is something you should be aware of if you ever get into the uh, state of being an investor. When they start to issue low denomination bonds, watch out. What happened in the 1960s was if you wanted to invest in New York City debt, you could only do it in gobs of, I don't know what, 50,000 or 100,000 or something like that. About 1970, 71, they suddenly announced that this had been a fantastic wealth, you know, wealth builder for the upper classes, and they were going to democratize it so you could now buy New York debt in, in items of, I don't know what it was, but $10 or something like that. So little people could finally buy into New York debt and get all the benefits of it. Little did they know that New York City was about to go bankrupt. So watch out whenever big power comes along and says, hey, we've got this great uh, example for you. You can, you can invest in this. You know, the small person can invest in this. Watch out because you're likely to get screwed. Uh, so you have that, that, that in this country, this, this is an ongoing thing where you move from, from sort of uh, then, then this, this gets set up. And that was what was set up in the 1970s, was the crash 
of federal financing of uh, municipal debt, federal financing of housing, federal financing of almost everything apart from the state budget. Uh, the, the, the fact that the United States is no longer going to act as the global currency uh, except uh, on the basis of a, global, of a floating exchange rate. And so we start to find a complete reorganization of big capital around this new situation in the 1970s. So, but that also said that capital was no longer going to invest. And capital saw the situation in, in the 1960s, was uncomfortable with all of these social movements to the degree that they became anti-capitalist, which they did, and anti-corporate, which might be more uh, exact, anti-corporate, uh, they started to say, we have to counterattack. And the counterattack came in the 1970s with the withdrawal of a lot of investment and the attack upon uh, federal expenditures and, 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 and the like. And the corporations at that point started to get together. And this was crucial because it, it, the capitalist class at that time was fairly well defined. It was, you know, it was the big order companies and the big steel companies and some of the big investment bankers. And it was fairly narrow and it was fairly co cohesive and coherent. And they started to set up all kinds of things uh, in order to be able to recuperate their, their power and their influence. They felt by 1975 that their power and their influence had been seriously compromised and they were determined to get it back. Furthermore, their wealth was being eroded by inflation and their wealth was being eroded also by the collapse of some of these corporations. So uh, big wealth started to organize, and it organized in a variety of ways. One of the ways was to set, get together and, and, and create something called the Business Roundtable. The Business Roundtable comprised about 60% you know, of the US GDP at the time, the heads of all of those, and they all sat together and said, OK, what are we going to do? Uh, there was a famous memo from Lewis Powell, who became a Supreme, Supreme Court Justice, in which he said, basically, the anti-corporate thing has gone too far. We need to uh, mobilize uh, all of our powers against it. And part of it is going to be an ideological thing. He didn't say this in the memo, but this is how it panned out. Part of it is going to be an ideological thing in which we're going to sort of attack uh, the sorts of things that are being said uh, in, uh, you know, the race stuff and the anti-war stuff. And so we're going to attack it. Uh, and, and we need institutions which will attack it. And if you go back, you'll suddenly find that all of these uh, sort of uh, uh, wealthy donors uh, setting up think tanks, the Manhattan Institute, uh, uh, Olin Foundation, uh, all, all of them, uh, the National Bureau of Economic Research also, which is a very respectable one, uh, all, all of them were producing knowledge producing uh, understanding. And Powell and the rest said basically, you know, this ideological conflict inside of the universities. The universities have, have actually opened themselves up to radical thinking and it's going to be very difficult to get the universities to kick that uh, aside. So we can't have a frontal assault. We're going to use, uh, I didn't say this, but it's essentially a Maoist strategy of surrounding uh, the city with a, by occupying the countryside and, 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 and in effect what they set out to do through these, all these think tanks was to surround the universities uh, with an alternative reality, an alternative think, set of think tanks. Very well financed, well paid and all the rest of it. And they secondly needed to mobilize uh, uh, political support. <clears throat> And this was something which, uh, again, was very, very significant. So there was the situation uh, about 1975. New York City is, in, is, is effectively bankrupt, run by the Municipal Assistance Corporation. And the Municipal Assistance Corporation uh, lived under the following, uh, situa following situation. Bondholders will not suffer any loss whatsoever. What happened was that all the receipts, all of the tax receipts to the New York City 
flowed into the Municipal Assistance Corporation. The Municipal Assistance Corporation paid off the bondholders. Then it gave whatever was left to the New York City budget, which meant that the New York City had to you know, lay off all kinds of people, had to spend all kinds of programs, had to you know, really go into an austerity mode, uh, fierce austerity, which was creating considerable but this was this was this was something very very significant, and it's the heart of what neoliberalism, and to many ways, this New York City thing is what I call the birth of neoliberalism, because it was there that they came up with the idea that the bondholders should never suffer; they should always get their thing. But the way that they should pay off any kind of debt of this kind was to be through uh, austerity measures administered to the population through government, either state governments or national governments or whatever. It was going to be austerity. So the response to the situation uh, in the 1970s was a transformation from largesse, throwing all that money at it in the 1960s, to austerity. And therefore, it's the politics of austerity that starts to be implemented from the mid-1970s onwards. And we'll talk further about that next time. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.